probably the best way to talk to spend an afternoon at two o'clock talking about latch contents. I can do nothing better than that. So either you guys have no life or you love latch contents so much that you happen to learn a lot about it. So my name is Arup Nanda and my best qualification is that I have been an Oracle DBA for 23 years. So not to mention my age, uh, you probably figure that out. I started my career with Oracle 6.0 as in production support DBA and then that's pretty much what I've been. And, um, and that's what I want to qualify myself as, as a long time Oracle DBA. That means I have, um, I lost hair um, because of uh, Oracle problems and um, I've solved them and I've, I've survived them. So that's, uh, that's a testament to how resilient Oracle is. And, um, and the large contention is just um, one of the things we have to deal with. Um, that was, we, we talk about that today. Uh, let's see, why is this thing popping up now? Don't know. Okay, sorry, this is covered my task. All right. Okay, so to talk about large contention, uh, this is what uh, we see. What is this thing? What is a latch? If I go to the Oracle glossary in the Oracle manuals, they say is a low level serialization control mechanism used to protect shared structure. It sounds like if I talk about what's a rope, it's a contraption to combine two different objects at two different locations. This is pretty much like that. So it just doesn't give a good explanation of what a latch is and how exactly to use. And the more important question is that, why do we see contention in the first place? Uh, so today we'll talk about that. We'll understand what latch contention is. What is the purpose of latch? Then what we specifically, what latch we talked about is buffer gas latches. We'll also talk about shared pool latches. We also understand how we can uh, identify uh, large contention weights, and then that when the database is completely hung, how you resolve it. And uh, the last one is plenty of demos. Actually, I cannot do that because of the this is not my laptop, and I cannot have the demos on this laptop. And also, I don't think there's a time to do it either. Uh, if you go to my blog, I actually have a video containing the demo itself, so you can probably get that very quickly as well. So let's go to the first one, which is what is a latch and what is the purpose of that latch? To do that, I have to ask for two volunteers. If you could just come down here, I'm not going to bite, I promise you that. If you just come down for a little bit. Peter, thank you very much. Neil, can I ask you for a volunteer as well? I appreciate that. So I have to step out of the microphone because this, for this demonstration, I need to just go there, but I'll come back right away. So, all right, I guess you can all hear me. Okay. So, uh, gentlemen over here, I will ask you to do one thing. Close your eyes and look in toward the front. You will not at any point look at me or in between. I'm going to wave this piece of paper in between you, and you have to feel exactly where the piece of paper is and grab it. Whoever grabs it will win something. Don't exactly why. So, but you can't look at it. You have to feel by the sound or whatever exactly where the paper is. So I'm down to one, two, one, three. I'll start waving the paper in front of me. So one, two, and three. Now grab it. <laughs> oh man! Oh, oh, Peter, sorry, you. sorry. <laughs> I broke, broke the latch. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, oh, you're not another one. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. So uh, as the demonstration suggested, this was something was a very valuable piece of information or something, some kind of asset. I asked two processes, if they will. They are, I asked them to grab it. Guess what? They grabbed it, tried to grab it without knowing exactly the paper is, with other person accessing it, and they tried to grab at the same time. And guess what happened? They broke into three different pieces. Could have been worse, actually. Uh, in fact, if you think about that, if all of us were trying to grab the same piece of paper, guess what have happened? You probably broke into probably multiple pieces, and each one of you got gotten one piece. If this was a, a currency, you probably wouldn't have done that. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so if this was probably, we probably wouldn't have been a great idea to have if it's an important piece of paper, etc. So think about that. In a machine, in the process space, if two processes go after something at the same time, how would they, how exactly that will work out? They can't. As I, if, I, if you uh, understand, I ask them not to look at the paper. That's important. I ask them to feel exactly where the paper is and try to grab it. So think about that. In a typical process, a process doesn't have eyes. 
it can do that. It has to go and go and grab it. And whoever tries to grab it, they at the same time, two people can actually grab it and they will probably rip it out. That, that, that uh, whatever the structure they're trying to get it. So um, imagine this on something else. Let's say all of you are DBAs of a single database. You have an init.ora file. You are all trying to update the file, different parameters, but you don't update the same file. You don't know who else is updating the same file. So you open up the file in VI, you try to update something. At the same time, somebody else in this group also opens the same file and tries to update something different. How do you know what will be saved at the end of it? You don't know. It might be fuzzy. Your, your change or the person's change, maybe nothing, maybe garbled, all that thing. So it's not a great way to resolve a problem by making sure. We, we have to make sure that only one person can access the file. But how do you do that? By the way, this is not a, not a very uh, hypothetical problem. This, actually, this problem actually does exist. So when I was working for, for a company a long, long time ago, we had a one database, we had three DBAs. So we had a simple mechanism. We would take away one of our, say, some kind of object, like say a key, and we would hang, this, this is phone is one of them, we would hang it in some place. And if I want to update the file, I will just go and grab it and take it with me. So if anybody else wants to update the file, they would go and look at that. If that object is not there, then they will simply stop. And they will come back and see when, that, that means somebody has been updating the file, they don't go and touch it. When I'm done, I go and return this object to its place. So everybody knows now that file can be updated. It's a simple mechanism, it did work. This is exactly how it works in a process as well. This is nothing to do with Oracle, by the way. This is simple processing inside any kind of operating system. If an operating system has to figure out there's a shared resource, so this could be a memory structure or something else like this, right? A shared memory structure. Two processes are trying to access it. There is no way for the OS to tell the process, hey, watch out. Find out who is there and then go and grab it. That's not going to happen. Now, yeah, sure, a process could go and ask everybody, hey, are you doing it? Are you updating it? Are you updating it? Are you catching it? Well, you could do that, but it'll take you forever. Think about that. If all of you are deviated the same, of the same database, you're trying to update the same file. If, if, if Peter wants to go on and tries to update the file, if he has to go and ask every one of you, that, hey, are you updating the file or not? It'd take a very long time for him to just to get that, that, that um, consensus that he's, nobody's updating that one. And by the time he probably get the consensus, guess what? Somebody else picks up and that does the same thing again. So it doesn't work out that way. So that's why the, 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 the device we just went, uh, came up on, uh, this is a device we want to say, that's the one we all will be looking for. If I update something, I go and grab it. And therefore, that's an indication to anybody else to update the same file that, no, this file is not off for updating because somebody else is doing it. I don't care who is doing it. Just not available right now. So when I, I am done, and done, I return this object, and then everybody else knows that, okay, if the, that object goes back to its position, that means it's available for updating right now. This object, which we use, is called a latch. That's a very simple thing. There's nothing there. So that a latch is just a mechanism to make sure that two people or two processes simply do not go after a shared structure at the very same time. That's a simple way of doing it. So the question you might ask is, if that is the case, you think this is, this is called in, in Oracle space also, if they're going to have the memory area or something, they're going to a latch as well. The next question you ask is that, well, is the latch is susceptible to the same problem? Because you have the same people going after the latch, so shouldn't they break the latch as well? No, they don't. Because first of all, a latch is not breakable. That's the first thing. Second, the latch is designed for that purpose only that it once some, some process takes it, other processes are excluded from using it. That's how it's done. And besides, if the latch is broken, we don't care because that's not the actual data or the structure, something we are trying to protect. So now you understand what latch is. Latch is simply a mechanism to make sure that the two processes will not go after the same area or same or shared structure at the very same time. The question is asking, the next question is that, seeing, then we have uh, the, the next question we have to speak in, in the Oracle terms is for spinning and slipping. Now here is an example. Suppose process one gets the latch. At that time, it goes to the memory. Process two wants to get the latch uh, as well because it wants to go to the memory. How will process two know 
that when process one is done updating. In a human term, what do you say? Hey, I want to use that memory structure. Are you done? So Peter, for example, say, yeah, sure. Hold on, five minutes. I'll be done or whatever I'm sorry. But remember, we are human beings, we communicate. Processes cannot communicate that way. And if they did, it will take forever. It'll be a chatter. You just can't afford to have that. So we can't afford to ask everybody, hey, are you done? How long will you be done, etc. Now I know it's a very crude joke, but this is a, actually a very appropriate joke. A toilet is a very important piece of information. When you go to the toilet, you see it, the, the latch is actually on. That means it's there. You definitely do not want to go in when somebody's using it. Now, of course, as a human being, you can say, scream, hey, buddy, are you done? How long will you be with them? Well, you can't ask the question. Let's say you know, don't understand the language or whatever. You simply cannot ask. You, what do you do? You sit there, <laughs> locked, OK? You tiptoe out. You watch out. And then you come back again. Is it done? No, it's not, OK? You tiptoe out and do that. That's exactly how Oracle processes do as well. When a latch is not available, every process simply tries to get that latch. If not, get it. So it'll be like a simple loop. Try to get it and things that is a loop, simple thing, loop. Find the latch, not found it, go back. Trying to find the latch, not found it, do that. Imagine that in a toilet, you have a single toilet. All of us go into the toilet to try to find out. If all of us do that, think about it in a you know, human term, our loop will be go and check it, go and check it constantly, keep on doing it. If all of us do that, it will be a chaos. We won't have space. So remember, every loop of a, props, of a program, a process, is a CPU cycle. So if everybody does that, they will obviously consume all the CPU cycles. So we can't afford to do that. So Oracle allows them to do this loop only for a certain amount of time. And that process of doing a loop is called spinning. Spinning is nothing but a loop. Am I, are you done? Am I, is it available? Is it available? Is it available? Constantly all the time. That's called spinning. And this spinning is a CPU intensive process. Therefore, at a, after a certain point, it has to stop spinning. And it defaults to 2000. By the way, that's not hard coded. You have a parameter called underscore spin underscore count that is up to 2000 times. And you can certainly increase it because if you think it's going to be available at that time, you can do it. But remember, every time you increase it, the processes will that take that many iterations to complete and then probably take more CPU cycles as well. So you have to think that in judicious terms, 2000 times. After that is done, think about in a toilet situation. You all hang out, well, is it done, is it done, is it done, is it done? You see it's not available. Then what do you do? You try, okay, let me do something productive. Let me go and update my slides or check something else out. I would drink up the water or something. You leave that area. A process simply what happens if it doesn't get the latch, it goes to sleep. When it goes to sleep, it doesn't go and consume CPU cycles anymore because it's not doing anything. It's going to slip at the time. For how long though? It sleeps for one millisecond at the time. After one millisecond, it will wake up and go to sleep again and go to check again if the latch is available. Not available, it goes back and sleeps for one more millisecond then goes back and checks it again. Doesn't get it. And now it times said, well, whoever is using that toilet is going to probably take a longer time. Let me come back in a slightly, slightly afterward, not right away. So instead of coming back after one millisecond, I'm going to come back after two milliseconds, not one millisecond anymore. So the sleep is two millisecond, then two millisecond, then four millisecond, then four, then eight, 16, 32, and it simply keeps on increasing. When it is sleeping, this process, process three, suppose, comes in and then comes in and checks. At that time, because the first time the process three comes in, it comes and says the latch is available because process one is done with the latch. Unfortunately, process two has been waiting for all this time, has gone to sleep. It can't. It doesn't know the latch became available. Process three comes in, opens the toilet door and goes in. So process two comes in, breathing mad that you know somebody has taken the spot, but that's how the latches work. This is exactly how it works in real life, doesn't it? So you go in there, you say somebody else comes in right away, the guy is out of the toilet, this person comes in, you come and check, he's gone. Because 
there is no queuing concept. So that's the big, big difference about that. Latches do not follow a queuing concept. A lock, on the other hand, is different. They actually have a queuing concept. So, so transaction one has done the lock. Transaction two is waiting for the lock to be available. Transaction three comes in, will wait after that. They follow a queue. That's why a lock is called an NQ. Latch is not a queue-based mechanism. Latch is whoever has, is available, trying to get it, got it available, grabs it. Just like in real life, there is no queue. If you check, if you leave it line, you lose it. Okay, so now that you understand the latches uh, exactly what it is for, now all those geeks in you must be wondering, okay, what is it? How does it look like? Well, it's a very simple memory structure, about 100 or 200 bytes, depending upon 32-bit or 64-bit Oracle. And uh, so if there's a memory structure, then what exactly is the value inside that memory structure? This is how it looks like. If the latch is not taken, it has a value of zero, which is not taken at all. You see the latch number one, two, three? Every latch has a number into that, that identifies it. Also has an address, because the memory structure is an address as well. Then if it is taken, what is exclusive latch, that means nobody else can do anything about it, nobody else can take it. Then the process that took the latch puts its own process ID using that. 0x is stands for actually hexadecimal, and then there's a hexadecimal number after that, that's what the value it puts it. Remember, this is a very small memory structure, so you can put a whole lot of stuff there. It just puts its own PID, it's exclusive lock. Sometimes a lock is exclusively taken, but is shareable. A simple example is that you have um, a toilet. I'm sorry, but this is a great, great appropriate example. If it's a um, gender neutral toilet and um, you could potentially use the, the two uh, things in there, but the person who comes in closes the front door. So it is supposed to be shareable, but the front door is locked. So it is taken in an exclusive mode. And the next one is obviously cerebral, but has been taken by many processes. A great example, you have a typical uh, restroom, uh, say men's room or a women's room, the front one, the front door itself that is cerebral. Once you go inside the front door, those stalls are of course exclusive, but the front door is not exclusive. That is called a cerebral latch. So if it is cerebral latch, then Oracle makes sure that it cannot put all the process IDs here. Why can't it? There's no space. So Oracle simply puts a count of how many processes have taken it. So you might be wondering the question, asking your question here. Wait a minute, if it doesn't put the PID in there, then how will I know who has the lock, who has the latch? That's the whole idea. I don't need to know who has the latch. I just need to know if the latch is available or not. Very simple thing. And that is a good thing and a bad thing. But before I say the good thing or bad thing, let's understand the first one. How is it a good thing? Because if you don't know who's actually taking the latch. Well, by not announcing who has the latch and who has it and etc., all the things that goes with it, if I just put a count over there and people just go on and, and grab it, it will solve a very simple problem. I don't need to go and examine what's inside it. And if I can do that, I reduce CPU cycles. A latch is all about quickness of access. And if I have a problem, if I have to write a program to go and look into that and, and find out who has it, who may be releasing it, all those things, if I do, I am wasting valuable CPU cycles. So you might be wondering, so isn't that kind of unfair? The, the process A comes in, got the latch, process B got it, waiting for it, went to sleep, process C comes in and suddenly gets it because process B was waiting before. Is it, isn't it unfair for process B? Yes, it is. But here's the reason why it's, 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 not, it's not that difficult or, or uh, important, is that a latch is typically for a system resource, like a memory or a CPU or something else like that. Those are typically for a very small duration. So it doesn't really matter how much actually people actually wait for that. So it's gonna be something where you get very quickly and you, by the time, after a few times I, I'm actually going through the iterations, you get it. So you actually do not waste a lot of time in waiting for that, that resource to be available to you. It's not a lock, lock is different. Lock is something you define, you create, you update a table, you got a lock. And you might not commit for a long time. In fact, you might not commit for days. In that case, the entire lock will be available to hold help for you. 
So it is quite possible. In a system resource, you don't control that. And generally, you get those things very, very quickly. And I will see some of the dialogues we will access, we will go through. It's not that important. That's the reason why it's not that important to maintain a queuing structure. If you did maintain a queuing structure, it would have been very difficult for Oracle, actually not, it would be time consuming for Oracle to maintain who is in the queue, who got it, and all that thing. It will simply make it very difficult and time consuming. That's the reason why Oracle gives away with the queuing structure to get something very, very quickly. Hope that kind of gets you the idea of why the queuing structure is not there anymore. So then the, uh, uh, how we get into the know of what the latches are, etc. Oracle does provide a certain VWR views. For those of you who know, this is nothing but a simply a memory structure. A VWR view is nothing but a memory structure. It's not a physical table. So it is a view into the memory structure, what this is it. And latches are nothing but memory structures. So V$ latch, for example, is nothing but an, an abstraction of the actual memory structure exposed to you as a X$ view, which in turn gets exposed to you as V$ view as well. So there are a few things I want to just show here, latch children, latch parent, latch holder, et cetera, and I'll explain to you what those things are right after this is all. That, uh, what is a parent latch and a, and a child latch, et cetera. One thing you have to understand in here is that, see the PID, that's a process ID, which is the Oracle process ID, not the uh, OS process ID, and that you can get from the video process. SID, of course, is a session ID, we all know that. L address is the address of the latch, which is the memory address, which is typically hexadecimal number. The latch name is the name, and gates is the time, how many times that latch was gotten. It also has things like slips, misses, et cetera, as well, and it can get, those things just tell you how many times it misses happened, how many times the slips happened, and so on and so forth. So how does it compare to locks? Very simple thing, latches are on physical things like CPUs, memory, structures, etc. And locks are on logical structures like rows that you lock a table, lock a row, etc. Um, and you don't actually, you can lock it, you can by command called lock, you can also update the row and it also locks the row by itself. You can't say, I want to put a latch on something. You can't do that. That's something Oracle has to do implicitly on your behalf. There is no queuing concept on, on latches and on the clocks, there is a queuing concept. That's one of the reasons why we call them N queues. So now I think there's a trivia thing for you know, to know that. And there's no ordering in latches. As you saw, process one has been got the lock, process two has been waiting, but process three comes in and suddenly gets the latch because it happened to be around at that time when process uh, two was slipping. Um, so in, in, there is no ordering concept. In locks, there is an ordering concept. And when multiple processors compete for the same latch, as we saw before, there is no guarantee whatsoever on who will get that latch. Whereas in locks, there is a guarantee of who get the latch afterwards. I'm sorry? Uh, could you repeat that? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. This is a it's a typo. It's a it says ordering. Sorry about that. Okay. So this now that you understand what latches are, let's talk about how we use them in real life or in, in how not we how does Oracle use them in in this uh, context. This is a picture you have seen that before. I don't I don't want to describe that. This is the Oracle instance. Now I didn't draw the picture. I got that from Oracle manuals. This is a pretty good picture. So this shows you the what instances are. I will talk about a specific one, which is the buffer cache and how exactly that is done. What is a buffer cache? I'm sure you all know. Buffer cache is where Oracle put the buffers in and to, to actually uh, to service a request from the customer. Let's see the first one, how that works. In the database, that's the actual file, the DB, that's on the file system. The buffer cache is in the memory of, of the Oracle instance over there. When I do a select star from something from EMP where something goes to something, what does Oracle do? Does it go to the, the database file directly and gets the data and then sends out to the customer to, to the uh, client? No, it doesn't. What it does that behind the scene, it actually moves that that data block from the from the file into one of the buffer caches. Now this is very important. A block goes from the disk into a buffer cache, and that's how after that it comes to the buffer cache. It goes from here. And then Oracle moves that uh, into the buffer, buffer cache over uh, to the one of the spaces in the buffer cache. And then from there, it goes into the, 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 uh, to the, the customer request. So if you think about this way, a buffer cache contains, let's say the entire auditorium is an, a buffer cache. Each of the chairs are buffers. 
that means they are they are available to be occupied. Each of you are data blocks. So that's that's the way to actually look at this one. So when you come in, you don't look around. Okay, I have my assigned spot here. You sit down wherever the next available spot is. So I can see that in this case, if it's a buffer cache, I can see very clearly that that side of the buffer cache is heavily loaded compared to this side. Don't know why, it's a message to me, probably I'm closer to you probably, but, but that's how it is loaded. So each of you have a specific assigned place. And if you think about that, each of the chairs are exactly same size, which is designed exactly for the, the one of the data blocks. Similarly, in the buffer cache, Oracle blocks are fixed, either eight kilobytes or four kilobytes or whatever you define them. And buffer cache is exactly eight kilobytes, if it is an eight kilobyte uh, block size in the database size itself. If you do define multiple block sizes in the table space, like you can do that uh, since Oracle 8.0, I believe, then Oracle does create a separate buffer cache for those specific ones. So buffers are exactly same size as a data block, but they're empty. In this case, we had an empty buffer cache, but if nothing happened. When I selected something, that data block, which contains the data I'm interested in, Oracle moves it from the file into the buffer cache. Not moves it, actually copies it over, not, nothing gets actually moved, copies them over. And from there, it services the request. Great, but as I said, when you have buffer cache is comp empty completely here. When you come in, you look at the next available empty chair and you sit down. Just like that, any things comes down here, they also sit down. Here's the problem. When, if I want to find out a specific person in this uh, room, what do we do? Well, as a human being, I can go yell, hey, I'm looking for John Smith. And somebody will say, okay, I'm John Smith. That's not something I can do if I'm a process. You know that? I have to go and ask, are you John Smith? No, actually, this is empty chairs. Are you John Smith? No, I'm not. Are you John Smith? No, I'm not. So I have to keep on asking everybody until I find John Smith. This is a very confusing and time-consuming process all the time. I have to constantly ask around. What if John Smith happens to be the very last person over there? It will take me a long time to look at the person. So I had a better idea. It was a smart idea. I mean, after all, I'm a reasonably okay smart person. So what I did, let's ask everybody to sit down in alphabetical order. So... A comes in, go sit down, B comes in, all that thing. Great. In that case, I'm looking for John Smith. I go to J and find out. Excellent idea, isn't it? Well, let's think about that. In a typical Oracle database, buffer cache, let's say the buffers are arranged in the same way. Let's say 10 comes in, then 20 comes in, I goes to next one. 30 comes in, goes to next one. Now I have a problem. 25 comes in. What do I do? In my smart idea of putting things together after one after each other, guess what I'll do? I have to ask them to have to put that right in the middle between 20 and 30. So what do I do? I said, 30, could you please move over one chair, please? And that's what I do. I have to move over right one chair and make room for 25 to come in there. Then I got my sequence. Think about that in a real life. If I ask him, persons, can people come in? They could come randomly in all kinds of order. If I, if when they come in, if I ask them to move one chair, can you imagine that? How, how much disruption it will cause to move from chair to chair to chair? Just not a practical option to do that. So what do I do? I can't really rely on this ordering approach. And you're talking about millions of buffers in the buffer cache, millions. So I can't possibly do all this ordering. I have to somehow locate them very quickly. So I have a better idea. After all, I'm a reasonably smart person and a better idea. So what do I do? I take those yellow sticky pads. You know, the yellow sticky pads. I write down every buffer. You know, every chair has an address. It has a number there, 15, 20, whatever the numbers are, the row number. And I say, when you come in, just put your name in the sticky pad and put in a little, like a uh, board behind me, like this way. So when the board comes in, that will tell me very clearly who is sitting where. So in this example, I can see that one, two, three, that is pointing to the buffer cache over here. This thing is this, this particular one is the thing is this information is exactly how Oracle stores as well. That it puts which buffer has what block that information is kept in the shared pool. Remember, it's in shared pool. It's not in the buffer cache. It's simply, what is the advantage? Advantage is that if you do have to move them around, 
you move around the buff the ones that are said pool only. You don't have to move around the buffers. Let the buffers just occupy the next available spot as the find is for, and that's it. This is called buffer handle. And if you ever have to identify what the buffer handles are in your own database, an instance, no need to look further. Look at X dollar BH. BH stands for buffer handle. They do not stand for block header. Some people confuse them by that block header. It's a buffer handle. Buffer handles are stored in shared pool. Another trivia question for you. So as you can see here, if my number of buffers increase, I have to increase that space in shared pool as well. So shared pool is not independent of buffer size. You might be thinking about that all wrong. So go and check in the buffers in, you can actually get that as well. So uh, X dollar BH is not something Oracle encourages to uh, search. That's why they also put a V dollar BH, which is nothing but an abstraction of the X dollar BH itself. This is great so far. Now, we still have one problem to handle. We still have to move these buffer handles in a sequential order. Otherwise, I can't find it. I, I can't do okay. So what do I do? Instead of putting them in the sequential order, what I do, I ask them, please tell me who is in front of me and who is behind me. So when these things come in, in, in the sequence, for example, the first 10, 20, 30, I put something called a forward pointer and a backward pointer on each of the buffer handles. So for example, the buffer handle of 20 says the forward pointer is 10 because 10 is in front of it. And the backward pointer is 30, the 30 is behind me. That's it. 10 says 20 is behind me and there is nobody in front of me. That's why the, the forward pointer is null and so on and so forth. When 25 comes in, I don't have to put that in between 10, 20 and 30. I can put it at the very end. But the only thing is that I have to update the buffer handles in such a way that 20 now points to 25 and 25's backward pointer points to 30. That's how it's done. So I don't have to move the buffer handles anymore. I have to simply update the buffer pointers forward or backward. Can I know these things, please? Absolutely. You can look, look at that. If you look at X dollar BH, you can look at the NXT underscore hash. It will tell you who's the next one. And the PRV underscore hash always will tell you who the previous one. So you can get that actually the buffer handles in a sequential manner using these two values. So in this case, for example, I can say buffer one, buffer two, it, the, the next hash will point to the previous hash. That's how we can define how the buffers are put next to each other. Now, here is a demo I wanted to put, but I can't show it here. If you ever have to do the demo, you can do a, you can download the session from my, my uh, blog, and you can uh, speak from the blog, and you can run that yourself. But do not run that on your production system because it's going to really uh, get a latch on the X dollar PH, and it might hang your system. So certainly do that in your uh, development database. You can get that as well. Okay, so so far so good, and on on you can understand how the buffers are linked together using this buffer chain. So a buffer, a forward pointer, and a backward pointer. There's one more thing, the problem though. So I'm still, in you know, I'm a process. I still have to think about how to get to a specific buffer. I still have to locate that buffer by asking around. Yeah, it does help me the forward pointer, the backward pointer, but I still have to traverse and go back and find out that look at the person I'm looking to. Like John Smith, I still have to find out where John Smith could be over there in the, in the buffer handle and find out and, and look at John Smith and then go to the, the specific buffer and get that. I can get that. The problem is that I still have to scan everything. What if John Smith happens to be the most, the last row on the buffer cast? doesn't really, uh, it takes me a long time for me to locate. So what I do, I define the rows in there. And in this case, what if I know that John Smith will be found in row number five? In that case, I, my scanning will be reduced. Instead of scanning all the 10 rows over here, I can scan only one row. I still have to scan them because I have to find out John Smith, because I have to keep on asking around, but I don't have to scan everything. Now, how does it work? Well, that's before I actually cut how to just work. That's the first one. So I have rows like this. Remember from my latch contention issue that if I have this memory structures that goes like this way, like buffers on the, in the chairs like this, I cannot allow two processes to go and scan for somebody in the same row. Because if they do, they might screw each other up. So to make sure that doesn't happen again, I have to put something called a latch in front of it. So latch will simply prevent 
two processes from going into the same chain at the same time. This latch is called a CAS buffer chain latch or a CBC latch, which you might have heard several times before. So what Oracle does that, it defines this, this multiple chains like this, continues, and each one is called a hash chain, or also called a CAS buffer chain. And each of the CAS buffer chains have a has either a CBC latch or a CBC latch or a hash latch to control that new two processes cannot go up to the same chain at the very same time. So that was the point behind hash chains. The next question you might ask is that, how do I know how many hash chains do I have in our own instance? No worries about that. Underscore, there's an underscore parameter called underscore blood, DB block has buckets. It also, by the way, also called has buckets. That controls how many hash chains you have. You can always increase it or decrease it, but by default, Oracle has a computational algorithm, it puts it there. And if you download the scripts from my blog, you can get that on doc.sql, that you will get that as well. So again, another um, um, another uh, demo, I can say you that, but one thing I tell you that, so how does Oracle know what specific block to put in what has chain? So to do that, I can make it very simple for you. Most of you are probably from United States and you probably have a social security number. I'm assuming that. If not, that's in some kind of a registration number or something that is unique to you. So I have 10 rows here. I do a modulus. I mean, divide that the number by 10. And the remainder, what comes out of it, it could be from zero if it's perfectly divisible by 10 or if it could be nine. Based on that, I ask you to put in a specific uh, row. So if you, let's say my... Uh, social security number is 100, which is exactly divided by 10, and my remainder will be zero. I ask you to put in row number zero, which is the first row. You get the idea, that's why. So if I come in, I'm looking for somebody with a, a number 100, all I have to do is that convert that 100 to a hash value, which is the remainder of a 10. So I got that value zero. Okay, you will be found in this row only. Don't even bother looking for any other row. That's how Oracle does it as well but there's no social security number for, for data blocks. Instead, for each block, Oracle assigns a unique value, call it DBA, data block address. So each block has a data block address, which is unique to the block, and it puts a has algorithm to find out which specific chain that block will go into. And that thing, if you want to find out yourself what it goes into, Oracle does provide a utility called uh, make data block address, you simply pass the file number and the block number, and you will get the, the data block address. And from there, it will, you can find out exactly which uh, specific uh, has bucket that, rope, that block must be going to. And again, you can download that and, and uh, show the demo here itself. Now, you saw the latch contention. Here's a there's little kink in the process. Remember, each latch can be tried several times, at least a slip that the spin time, and that consumes CPU cycles, and also takes up memory as well. So Oracle thinks latches are expensive. Let's not create a lot of latches. So how about we put a single latch for two different rows? So if you think about that, imagine a parking garage, a multi-level parking garage. Most of you probably are aware of the parking garage. What do you do in a parking garage? You go in there and you find out which uh, floor is probably have an empty spot and you go around. Very inefficient uh, use of your time and the resources. Instead, you are told right up front that based on your last name, you will go to the specific level. If your last name starts with N, you'll go to only level number N. You will not look for anything except N. You go in there. But guess what? You cheat. So my last name starts with N. I should go to N, but I have to go to N. I go in, I say, hey, there is space available in A. So I go in and park there. Now, everybody cheats like that. Guess what? The system is not going to work. So what we do, we put a security guard in front of every uh, level. That guard will check your driver's license, check your last name. If it does not correspond to what the floor that number is, ask you to move on. Okay, that works. That security guard is our latch. The problem is that I have to pay for the security guard. I have to pay for the benefits. It becomes expensive. So then we figure out, hey, X and Y and Z, I don't see many people with the last names X, Y, and Z. So let's combine all that into a single security guard, right? That's what that works out well. 
so that I don't repay it three times. Great. Similarly, Oracle thinks latches are expensive. So Oracle creates actually less number of latches as that many buckets. So what that means is sometimes a single latch may be used for two different hash buckets. Like for example, this first one, the HC1 and HC2, the two different labs, the hash, the hash chains, they have the same latch, L1. Guess what happens? If two processes go, process one wants to go after SC1 and process two wants to go after SC2, they could do that, but they can't. Why? Because process one will grab L1, the latch, and it will not allow L2 to come in. So that's going to happen. So that qu the question is that, how do you know how many latches do you have available? Well, you don't have to make, look over anymore. The number of latches are controlled by another underscore parameter called underscore DB block has latches. Those two are also available as well. So as you can see here, by definition, the number of latches is less compared to the number of has chains. If you, you can definitely increase it. In fact, I would encourage you to actually increase the number of uh, hash latches to make it the same. So two processes are not waiting for the same hash chain artificially by doing this way. And in modern operating systems and modern uh, computers, um, the CPU cycles are pretty, uh, I would say, inexpensive compared to what we have been before. You can certainly do that. Question, next question you might ask is that, how do you find out which specific latch is holding on or which specific block? But guess what? In this example, if block number 14 is very popular, everybody wants block number 14. Everybody wants Tim Gorman here on go. He's a very popular person. But guess what? Tim Gorman is, happens to be in row number two and everyone goes to row number two. Well, unfortunately, what happens? So what's your name? Tony. So Tony, when someone wants to go for Tony, guess what? They have to wait because Tony, um, the team over here is very popular. So he's holding up the latch. In this case, if 14 is very popular, everybody on that chain will have to wait. Or I'm sorry, other way. If anybody wants to go to, let's say, number seven over there, they have to wait. And it makes worse because if somebody wants to go to number six, number six happens to be in a totally different chain. They could have gone. Unfortunately, we have a budget for only one security guard, which is L1. Everybody has to go through the same security guard L1, and everybody for the say, number two will also wait. This is a clear contention for CASP or for chain, and you can get that easily as well. So the next thing you have to find out is that which specific blocks are in which specific latches which might cause a contention. And the two things, and this is available right away from X dollar BH. And that's HL address is the latch address, the file number and the block number. Together, you can find out what the object that belongs to. I have two specific uh, scripts there. You can, you can go use that to find out specifically what batch is there. So how do you find out CBC latches? Very simple thing. Find out uh, the rows and the blocks. You can get that. I have, again, the, all the scripts you can download. I don't want to, you can see the video as well, how I do that. And the last one is find out the objects uh, by total buffers for large, et cetera. That will tell me if I have a very popular object in one of the latches. So how do you solve it? Very simple thing. How do you solve that first one? So reducing CBC latches. Obviously, if you have less number of logical IOs, that means you are wait less number of latches to be acquired, and that will solve the problem. What about if you have, say, if you have more index limiting scans? In that case, you don't, you're not scanning the entire time, entire buffer cache all the time, and have nest, nest, nested loops as well. But there are some, some of the things you can also do. You can increase the PCT free init trans, et cetera, to make the blocks less compact. You know that each block has a certain number of rows. The more rows you have, the more popular that block is. In this example, I can see this particular row is very popular. But let's say the very last row is not because there are very few people over there. So if you, do, if you make sure there are only few people per block, then of course, that you have used that become also make the popularity come down as well. So you can certainly do that. You're increasing the PCT free by increasing the init trans, et cetera. And another thing you can do, if you partition the objects, each object becomes, I'm sorry, each partition becomes a separate segment. And they could potentially go into multiple blocks without you changing a single line of code as well. You can do an alter, ta alter ta table move, and you can do that, and uh, even in 12C, actually that becomes, I mean, online operation. You can also do alter index rebuild, 
by doing this kind of operation, you distribute that across other, every time you do the alternate table move, alternate index variable, you, in, you change their object ID, and that means you also change that data block address. And that means you may potentially go into a different row. Imagine that if you change your social security number, you may potentially be assigned to a, a separate row in this in the auditorium. Similarly, if you alter the that maybe data block address, you might potentially do that as well. So, and uh, you can also increase the number of CVC latches. We saw that before, and uh, you can also increase the number of hash buckets. We saw that as well. How to do this before? So that's how you can typically do this. Again, to conclude on this, this one that the event column in the video session shows underscore cash, uh, sorry, percentage cash buffer percentage, that will show you clearly what is as the, what the session is waiting for. And if you want to find out historically what I have been waiting for, if you have the access to the ASH the table, Vital Active Session History, you can get that. And you can, I have a script for that as well, you can download from here. And uh, to convert that information to text as well, you could do that. I have a whole blog entry on this one, so I don't want to go into that. That entry does have a very detailed step-by-step -step instruction on how to get this information, how to get these things going. So that's the how you solve the cast buffer chain problem. And, and it's not that difficult to solve it. Um, I don't think I have more time to uh, came, right? Okay, sorry. So I will skip this library cast latches because this is always a very interesting topic. I can't really do it. I will just I'll, I'll let you go through the, all the demos, etc., and to do this one. Um, the last thing I want to do is that when you cannot even connect to a SQL um, a session using SQL DBA, for those of you who go back to Oracle 7, remember there was something called Connect Internal that actually worked all the time. Unfortunately, Oracle took that away from us in Oracle 8 onwards. You didn't have a Connect Internal anymore. So you, the question is that if a session is complete, the system is completely hung, how do I connect to it? Now, Oracle does provide a way. For some reason, it's not documented. And that is very simple. You see, SQL plus minus prelim forward source says DBA. That allows you to connect to SQL prompt. You can't do queries anymore because at that time, a SQL layer is not available. You can do ORA debug. And that's how we can find out ORA debug dump hang analyst 12. That will create a trace file, which will tell you very clearly how exactly who is holding that log as well. And it will not work with 11.2. There's a mass node on that one, but there's a workaround also in the same mass node if you want to find out. All right. Uh, the last one I want to say is mutex. Everybody said that. Okay. Soon that mutex be something great, uh, better than sliced bread uh, after latches. No. The only difference between mutex and latch is that mutex is a simple, simpler latch. So as opposed to, for example, instead of 100 bytes, it has only 28 bytes. And it, as a result of that, it also takes a less number of computations to get a mutex. So mutex is nothing but a large for all practical purposes, but it takes less effort to acquire one and keep one. That's why Oracle is converting slowly things into mutex. Because all you need to know, is it acquired or not acquired? That's it. Not anything more than that. That's all it is. So that's why mutex is not, not something really uh, not worth getting too much into. All right, so that's all I can say about large contentions and hope you got an idea about large contention. You can please go through my blog if I have a lot of interesting entries on that one, everything I mentioned to here. You can download the scripts as well. And I would, as always, I will I thank you for your time and I'd love to hear your feedback, whatever you have. Thank you very much for your time.